Oops. Sorry about this is the Janus Oasis, and I am Nola Simon, the host. I am honored today to have the woman who actually hired me 19 years ago. <laughs> and her name is Ann Comer, and she actually works for Hydra Kid Struggles. But back 19 years ago, I was being uh, interviewed at a company. If you're familiar with any of my stories, you may have come across my most viral post where I actually made a joke about Arnold Schwarzenegger. I got over probably 70,000 views on that. And I had the editors at LinkedIn commenting on it. And it was funny. And they were trying to get Arnold to comment on it. So Anne was not the hiring manager in the middle of that story. She was not there when that fire alarm went off. And in fact, she actually didn't even know about the story. It was funny. I told it to her on LinkedIn. And she was the second interviewer. She was the person who made the final decision. She was the director at the time. So that's how I know Anne. But many different things have happened to Anne since we first met, and I'm going to turn it over to her to introduce her work currently. Thanks so, thank so much, Nola. Yeah. Thank you. And that was a wonderful interview. I still remember that interview and how impressive you were. And you had this big binder of all the kudos that you would have received. And I thought, <laughs> wow, <laughs> this is amazing. So yeah, so my name is Anne Comer. I'm a principal at Hydric and Struggles. And I work in our organizational culture and diversity, equity, and inclusion practices. And this is something that I've really been focused on really my entire life. This is a, a long, has long been a passion for me. So I grew up in rural Quebec as a person of color and an English speaker. I had a couple areas where I was not fitting into the majority. And creating an environment where people really felt that they belong and people become more comfortable with differences and start to see that underneath those differences, we actually have a lot in common with each other, has been a passion of mine really all of my life. And so first, starting to work in organizational culture and helping people work better across differences, collaborate better, have better teamwork was the beginning of that. And then in the last few years, I've really branched out into diversity, equity, and inclusion, where there's even more of, an, of a focus on helping people work more effectively across difference, be more inclusive. Yeah. And it's wonderful. I remember, honestly, you were always like that, right? So I think that's wonderful mm -hmm. that you're able to bring something that you've You've really been working on your entire life and then just bringing that to your work and mm -hmm. making that a focus to really be able to help people. And belonging is a huge aspect of hybrid remote work. It's one thing to bring people into the office. They have a sense of belonging. I remember once when my kids were really small, I remember walking through the office doors and just being grateful that I had a place to go where people would actually speak full sentences in English and not scream at me. They might've yeah. been screaming at me, but at least I would understand what they were saying. <laughs> So how do you create a sense of belonging that's not necessarily even tied to a desk? So from our perspective, having a sense of belonging comes from the intentional act of making people feel included. And that's helping people feel valued, respected, and supported. And when people feel valued, respected, respected and supported, usually what comes out of that is that feeling of belonging, that I belong here, my views are valued, people want to hear them, I feel comfortable expressing myself, sharing my ideas, I'm not holding back. So that sense of belonging comes from that intentional action from the people that we work with. And if it's in a workplace where you can physically meet each other, that's one way of doing that. But you can also do that. You can make people feel valued, respected, and supported in a virtual environment as well. It doesn't have to be in person. You can ask people for their opinion. You can appreciate their opinions, uh, just as a couple simple examples. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. I personally always used online for that. And that's really where my interest in social media really started taking off. I started using uh, Teams and I started using uh, Yammer, which are our internal Microsoft tools that, that companies sometimes use. And I used the same sort of social media skills internally. And that's where I really had to raise my profile. So what I discovered was I was working in the American division for 16 years and nobody knew who I was. Nobody in Canada actually understood that even there were actually U.S. division employees in Toronto. So I really had to amplify my profile so I could actually transition and get hired in the Canadian division. Right. So that was something that I found, even though I'd worked for the company for years and years, I didn't feel that I, would, I, was, I belonged and I, I recognized in that bigger division. 
And so I use the tools to be able to do that. And honestly, the same sort of skills that I've used to get that different promotion to actually do all the work that I've been doing on LinkedIn and Twitter, that is the same sort of skill that I've been using in bringing in media interviews as well, too. So I've been interviewed by the CBC, CTV News. I've had four interviews with the Toronto Star now. And it's an excellent way to really raise your profile, but to really get recognized and rewarded. Now, most people are not looking to get into media. Most people really just want to be able to build a network that allow them to do better work. But that's an example of how you can start small and then escalate it. And you can do that internally because internal yeah. organizations have tools that allow you to connect beyond your own geography, whether yep. it's Slack or whatever tool that your company uses. And the more active you can be in there, selecting the channels that you're most interested in so that yep. you're using your time judiciously, uh, yep. it can be a great way to connect with people with uh, similar interests. And That's right. Yeah. Out there and get people to know who you are as a person. Yeah. And the tools I actually find you're able to approach people more directly that are more senior in your organization. It's easier really to have conversations than it used to be. I remember like back when I was hired, there was a real reluctance to approach anybody who was senior. It's really nice now. It really breaks down the hierarchy because when you're in a social media environment, you can just reach out to anyone. You can respond to anyone. And it's, uh, it's very equalizing that way. That's right. And you're talking to them like they're a person, right? Yes. There's no... There's a lot less formality. And so yeah. I find that really enhances the sense of belonging as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I've noticed a lot of people are talking, especially if they have, if they're, they're people of color, they've been talking that they've actually found it better to actually be at home the last few years because they've experienced fewer microaggressions. Mm -hmm. So have you come across that and have you come across companies that are actually trying to, who are struggling that with that in their culture? How are they actually accommodating and, and addressing that going forward? Because it's hard to walk back into an office knowing that you're opening yourself up for something that you perceived as negative, right? That is negative. Yeah, that's absolutely been an issue for a lot of people, particularly people of color, as you said. And it's really, I think about creating that environment where there is greater awareness. I think people weren't always aware that these things were happening. And I think there has to be a conversation that these kinds of micro exclusions actually happen in the workplace and educating people on what it is, what it looks like, because they're often not conscious. When I say something to someone that is received as a micro exclusion, it's not necessarily because I'm intending to do that. It's because of maybe an unconscious belief that I have or conscious belief that I'm not consciously expressing. And it comes out in, in these ways. And I think it's really important for people to have these conversations and start educating um, leaders and team members on the dynamics of these micro exclusion, how that happens to become more aware of it so that we can actually start um, celebrating people's differences as opposed to being uncomfortable with people's differences. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And actually uh, the kids book that I'm in, the You've Got Quirks by Kristen Sherry, that book is actually about how to talk about differences because every character in the book actually has something different. There's somebody who has vitiligo, my Wardenburg syndrome. That's why my hair is white. There's a character who doesn't have arms and legs. There's a comedian from Australia. She used to blow snot bubbles out of her nose when she was a kid when she laughed. <laughs> It could be a lot of different things and a lot of different differences. And that's why I wanted to be a part of that because I really perceive that there's an opportunity to really have those types of discussions as kids with their parents, with their teachers and their, just their community. And, and honestly, Kristen's getting like amazing feedback from people who are recognizing themselves in this book and hearing stories about something that was really challenging to deal with. And I was called grandma since the time I was seven years old and really kind of being able to talk about it with transparency and help others necessarily avoid the, maybe not completely avoid the, the scenario, but know how to deal with it and know that eventually, like if you're coping through it and living through it, it becomes a strength and you can make it better all the way around. Yeah. And once people start valuing different, all the research shows us that diverse teams outperform homogenous teams, right? There's yes. all kinds of research to support that. 
And once we start valuing and recognizing the value that different perspectives and all types of differences bring to our work, to our lives, then we start behaving differently. Once yes. I start valuing differences, as opposed to being uncomfortable or intimidated or whatever my reaction might be to difference, once I start valuing it, then I can really start, I will behave differently. I will ask more questions of people who have different perspectives. I won't feel threatened when someone has a different perspective because I understand that it's actually adding to the bigger picture that I can now see. I'm seeing, I'm seeing more than I used to see before. Someone else can fill in some of my blind spots, for example someone yeah. who has a very different perspective. So there's, there's an element of, a really big element of self-awareness in creating this environment of inclusivity and making everyone feel that sense of belonging. We talk about these inclusive mindsets. Self-awareness is, is one of them. It's foundational to good leadership of any kind, but inclusive leadership, it's still a part of that. But there's also curiosity. So about how do we approach differences? If I get curious about how did your experience having white hair when you were really young, how did that, what impact did that have on you? And what, how do you, what do you bring from that into the workplace? What perspective does that give you that's different from the one that I have with my different background? So getting curious about people's differences, about what different ideas that they can bring is another of those mindsets, really asking questions from a place of humility, understanding that I don't see the whole picture, I can never see the whole picture, but other people, if we put all of our perspectives together, we can get a much richer view of what's actually going on. And research shows us that when we're doing simple tasks, it doesn't really, the diversity isn't as important, but we work in organizations where we're solving complex problems. And when we are dealing with more complex types of tasks, that diversity is a huge advantage. And so being able to tap into that with curiosity, that's why that's one of the, that's the second inclusive mindset. There are three others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure it's very extensive. But to answer your question, how white hair affected me when I was a child, I was very alert to ageism from a very early age, right? right? Yeah. So like when I was 32, I had my first baby and I remember I was at the store and uh, gentleman who's worked there, he, he was very kind, but he was not necessarily observant. And he asked me if it was my first grandchild. <gasps> yeah, I was 32. I remember being extremely upset and working an appointment with my doctor to say, okay, what's wrong with me? And he's no, it's him. It's not you. <laughs> <laughs> it's people moving fast and not paying attention. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And I, if I go out with my dad, I'm offered seniors discounts, which I decline. When I went on the cruise with him, I fit in completely well because we went on Holland American. It was like full of seniors. The only thing that gave me away were my knees. I, apparently I, <sighs> I moved too well for you know, young knees. <laughs> But that's a huge part because yeah. everybody's aware of those different biases. And if you're surfacing that and you're voicing the concerns, I think one of the best questions you can really ask as a leader is really who else needs to be in this room? Who haven't we heard from? Yeah. Well, and speaking of biases, I can see someone else's biases, but I don't see my own. Right. I might notice someone else's blind spots, but I don't see my own. Yeah. It's hard to see that stuff in yourself. That's why the self-awareness piece is so important in leadership and inclusive leadership, because it's the foundation. And if I'm not asking those questions coming from curiosity, I'm not even going to notice that I have blind spots. But the richness of you get when you ask those questions is really quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I spend most of my life asking questions. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. My my curiosity is really high. <laughs> yeah, exactly the same. Yeah. So when we talk about other biases that come up in hybrid remote work, I've heard it called distance bias lately, but it's also uh, proximity bias. So the idea that people, if they're going to continue working remotely or they're hybrid and they're not necessarily in the office all the time, they're going to suffer from lack of opportunity to impress people so that they get promotions. There's a real fear that proximity bias is really going to be a factor that's going to inhibit their career. Is that something that you've worked with? It's something that I'm definitely hearing about that issue that if you're, what does work look like? So sometimes leaders want to see work happening. Right. 
but what we need to be looking at is the output, right? What are the outcomes that we're actually paying attention to? And something I've been hearing about more recently is distributed leadership, assigning, empowering people on your team to be responsible for areas that maybe they have expertise in and making sure that they have decision-making authority so that they are empowered to reach out and connect to get input from people that they need input from, but to be able to make decisions within their area of, of, of knowledge or expertise. And so we need to get more comfortable with different models like that of how do we lead rather than walking around the office and checking in with each person one by one, how do I connect with people in a, in a virtual environment? Some of them might be in the office sometimes, but I also need to connect with people in a virtual way. Yeah, definitely. And honestly, just one of the things about being in the office too is, is just the screens. So if you're having a meeting, like the worst experience you can have as a remote worker is really just being like the screen on the end of the, like the conference table and nobody else is on screen. Yes. Yeah. So we have to be much more intentional about yeah. asking, remembering to ask the person online, having them go first. That's those are just um, meeting techniques that become more important. They're important when we're all together in person because there are always going to be some more extroverted people who will have all the airspace and talk a lot more, <laughs> more introverted people. So there's always a need in an in-person meeting to draw out the people or give them an opportunity to think before the meeting so that they come in prepared to share their ideas. There are things that you need to do, but it becomes even more important in, in a hybrid environment. Exactly. Those, those asynchronous tools are actually really important. The agenda, having things actually completed before you even really get to the meeting so that you really understand what the purpose of the meeting is trying to achieve. The work isn't necessarily happening at the meeting. A lot of times the work is happening outside of the meeting, but that's a different way of working for a lot of people. So yeah. that's interesting. And then the other bias is recency bias. So uh, a lot of people are influenced by the person they most recently spoke to. Mm-hmm. So if managers are forgetting, like you said, like the person who's at home who might have input, how do you stay top of mind? Really, like you said, like developing and using the tools. And I personally found, as I said, like using the like Yammer and social media, I had no problem staying top of mind because I was in their pocket, <laughs> in their right, right. inbox, well, right? It, yeah. And in my own experience, what I found has been really helpful is just it's simple. It's pretty low tech. It's setting up meetings with people. Yep. And when you're working in an office, you don't really have to do that because you know that you'll, you'll run into them at some point and you yep. can stop them in the hall and have a conversation. But what yep. I've been doing over the last two years is being more intentional about setting up recurring meetings with people just to make sure that I stay in touch with them. Uh, and that's yep. been really helpful. And they don't have to be long, doesn't have to be often, but it's just a little touch point to make sure that I'm you know, staying in touch with people that I need to work with, collaborate with, learn from, whatever it might be. Yep, exactly. And even participating in like employee resource groups, that was actually an interesting part. When I actually went 100% remote, I actually didn't like it because the employee resource groups, I had no access to the building and neither did my boss or my boss's boss. So if for me to actually go in and network with people that I wanted to meet in person to be able to achieve better uh, results for the employee resource group, again, this was all volunteered. It wasn't paid. Mm-hmm. I basically had to track down somebody who had access to the building to be able to authorize that. And I can tell you that went over with a lead balloon in the leadership team <laughs> because they couldn't even approve it. I had to negotiate it myself. So right. So it was a form of exclusion that I never even considered yeah. before I took a remote job. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So access to the physical access to the building was something right. you didn't have as a remote worker. Yeah. Because the perception was it was sales oriented. Your job was completely focused on external vendors. Why would you need to have access to the building? And it was a whole security function. So they, you didn't have access. Like I, I had my pass because I never gave it back, <laughs> but all the access had been removed from it. Mm-hmm. So I, I did an innovation challenge. I was actually the finalist in the innovation challenge. And I had to hunt down people to allow me to come in to participate in a challenge that the company had organized. <laughs> that's yeah. That's so funny. What? Yeah. It wasn't really, I felt excluded. Well, you were physically excluded from the building. Yeah, exactly. But what was funny is I actually took a photo of that day of, of yeah. like a newly renovated area in the building and posted that online. And I actually beat the CEO to actually posting it. So I felt uh, excluded, but yet super connected. 
Yes. Yeah, upside down world. Right? Oh, it's really weird. Yeah. It's really weird. Yeah. Yeah. But what strikes me about what you're saying is we get trapped in our thinking. We get locked into a particular way of thinking about it. Those leaders in your organization were thinking she's doing a sales job. It's external. Why would she need access to this? But if you're thinking from a broader perspective, well, you're still part of the company. What is a company if not a collection of individuals? Yep. And right. even grade nine days. So my daughters were both born when I worked for the company because I worked for the company for 17 and a half years. Mm -hmm. It was the only company my either of my children had known. And so when grade nine came around, I was 100% remote. I didn't have an office to take them to. Yeah. So I had to beg, borrow, and steal my way into a grade nine event out in Kitchener. And that was like a two and a half, two hour commute. We got lost. So it was probably two hours, two and a half hours, because I don't go to Kitchener very often. But yeah, I, but we didn't have a job to really do there because my job was not focused in the office. So it was actually really interesting. I signed up to, I volunteered for a change management video. They had renovated the office. So I did a ch like videos to help people adapt to that change. I was actually the star of the show. And my daughter got to operate the video clapper. So how they, they, they use it for, yeah, yeah, it was so it was like the video clapper that they use for like movie shoots. And she had a ball and it was just so much fun. There were other grade nine day people who were actually volunteering for that as well too. And she, when she went, actually went back to class, she had the best story to tell, but it was because we completely had to invent it. Mm -hmm. We created it, but I almost didn't even get permission to do that day. Because you didn't fit the mold. Because I didn't fit the mold. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just who I am that I, I ask for things. But that's important. I think it's really important that we take advantage. This is a moment in time when we may have opportunities to speak up where maybe yes. we didn't before. I think that we're at a point of transition. We're hearing about people really reconsidering their roles and their jobs and resigning. And we hear about the great resignation or the great rethink or whatever we want to call it. <laughs> whatever, but put air quotes around it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it is definitely a time of transition, which means that it's a wonderful opportunity for us to really speak up and negotiate what do we want in yep. our work lives. Because if we don't speak up, it'll just be, the parameters will be set for us. But if we, set, we, we speak up and we say, okay, these are the non-negotiables. This is what I need in a hybrid work environment. This is the opportunity to do it because it's a little bit more of an employee's market than it has been for a number of years. And so that gives us a little more leverage, a little more power in those conversations yep, that we might not have had agree. two years ago. Yeah, I agree. I was reading a book about influence. The professor actually responded to me on Twitter. It was cool. It was Saturday night. She's answering my questions. She runs the most popular course at Yale University and she's answering my questions on a Saturday night <laughs> and so her she has a question that she actually calls the magic question and it's what would it take what would it take for me to achieve this mm -hmm. and she tells a story about a company that had uh, it was overrun with a demand for a product they were producing and they needed all hands on deck to really work overtime over a holiday weekend and they could have mandated it. They could have mandated all the overtime and that wouldn't have gone over well. Mm -hmm. And what they did instead was they asked, what would it take? And so they arranged for daycare. They arranged for Christmas present wrapping. They arranged for pizza. And this, they met all of the requests from the employees. And what they ended up with was a collaborative event that helped the company exceed their goals. Everybody obviously got overtime pay too, but it just really improved the morale even though everybody didn't want to work over Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question for employers it to is. ask, but I think yeah. it's also a great question for individuals to ask. Yes. Like, what would it take for my needs to be met? What yeah. Would it be, right? Yeah, exactly. That's right. And like a lot of employers are starting back with the like the three uh, days a week, trying that out, two yeah. days remote. So I think that a lot of employers are, are set in stone. That's what we're doing. They're, they're mandating it. But I think that's a question that you could ask and say, okay, I really need for this purpose, I really need to be at home, say, four days a week. I only want to come in one day a week. What would it take? Exactly. Negotiating strategy. It's the time right? to negotiate. 
This is yeah, it is definitely the time for negotiating. And the other thing we had talked about briefly before we started recording was about grief. So it's a change process. What are you losing by going back to the office? People are feeling that they're losing autonomy, they're losing flexibility, they're losing safety, all kinds of different perceptions of loss. And you had commented that it's almost like a grief process. Mm -hmm. You have to go through uh, grieving before you accept something. But to your point about the great resignation, what happens if you have a choice? Like if somebody dies, you don't have a choice to Mm -hmm. grieve them. But when it's this type of loss and there are other employers who are offering that flexibility and that um, autonomy and that care and respect, do you really have to grieve if your employer chooses not to offer that to you? That's, Mm -hmm. I think fundamentally part of the great resignation. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is when we fell into the pandemic, it happened so quickly that there was this mass distress. It was even beyond grieving. I think everyone was very upset and having all kinds of uh, reactions to it, but there was a grieving as well, right? When we lost the connection that we had at work and interacting with our colleagues who had become our friends. And there was a lot that we lost through the pandemic. And I think everyone has is feeling that and feeling the strain of that. The, the issues that we've had with mental health over the last two years, I think that's pretty significant. And now that we're coming back, it's another change and it's just human nature. Whenever right. we're faced with a change, oh, now we're going back to what we missed two years ago and we still need to grieve because it's still a change. And right. when we experience a change as something new is emerging, something old is ending. And we right. have to honor the something old that's ending. And sometimes we even have to grieve the something old that's ending, but it creates a possibility for something new. And so what I see is how do I start articulating what it, what this something new might be? What are the possibilities that I can step into? How do I start asking for that? How do I negotiate that in my, um, in my work life? And exactly to your point, the employers that are not going to be agile enough, flexible enough um, to deal with what people's needs are in this hybrid environment, they may lose out on employees. They may not have the, they may not be able to attract people. They may not be able to retain people. And the yeah. way that employers that are more, more comfortable with the flexibility that's required from hybrid working will be. Yeah, exactly. And it's all about the reframe, right? Like how do yeah. you reframe it yeah. to be something that honors the perception of loss, but gets them excited about the potential of the future. And that's really Honestly, what the Janus Oasis is about is like, how do you bring the best of the past into the future and co-create the future that you want? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, Yeah, I love that too. I'm getting actually chills to be able to (laughs) tie that back to the mission statement of my podcast. (laughs) You learn from the past and I I always love to be future oriented. What can we do? And that's what you want to do. You pick up the lessons that you've learned and, and move forward. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly why I wanted to have you on because you are my past, but you're also going to be part of the whole future of everything that's going to be happening in the workforce. And so I really appreciate having you here, Anne. It's so lovely to connect with you again, and I can't wait to see the work that you do with us. Thank you, Noah. Likewise, I'm really, I'm just loving the work that you're doing, and I love the mission of your podcast. And so it's a real pleasure and honor to be here with you today. (laughs) Yay. Anyways, thank you so much. 